Uh, we wanna welcome everybody uh, to the U.S. Kuwait Business Council's third major virtual event uh, of 2020. Uh, some of you may recall in April, we hosted uh, Sheikh Mashal al Sabah of Kadipa for an update on Kuwait's efforts to mitigate the impacts of COVID-19. And just last month, uh, we hosted both Ambassador uh, El Sabah from here in Washington and Ambassador Romanowski uh, for a council strategy session to outline some plans for the remainder of 2020 and into the new year. And today, I think uh, we're very excited because we're again bringing a, really an all-star lineup of speakers and really look forward to uh, what we believe will be a substantive conversation. Um, for our webinar today, it's a collaboration between the U.S. Kuwait Business Council and the Kuwait Banking Association. And the speakers will in essence be providing an outlook and we'll turn to them uh, shortly. But I'm also very delighted uh, that we're joined uh, today by a very special guest, uh, Mr. Farouk Bastaki, a managing director, group CEO, chairman of the executive committee of the board of the Kuwait Investment Authority. He's been kind enough to join and, and will shortly offering, offer some opening comments. And before turning to our esteemed speakers, I, I just want to briefly share an overview of the U.S. Chamber uh, and our U.S. Kuwait Business Council. As I know, we're joined uh, today by many who were engaging uh, for the first time. Uh, the U.S. Chamber represents the interest of about three million companies of all sizes and sectors and locales uh, across the United States. Uh, for more than 100 years, uh, we've served as essentially the voice of business in the United States, where we engage Congress and the White House in that alphabet soup of regulatory agencies on those issues that impact companies' bottom line uh, and their investment and commercial decisions. And that can range from taxes to the regulatory environment to trade, immigration, healthcare, and many, many more. And while we're most known for that domestic activity, uh, in fact, our international division at the U.S. Chamber is the largest part of the U.S. Chamber. Uh, perhaps reflecting the outlook and interest and uh, opportunities seen by American companies around the globe. And in the international division, we're actually home to more than 20 uh, bilateral business councils. And I'm proud to say that the U.S. Kuwait Business Council is the newest member of our family. Uh, we were pleased that last October, we formally launched uh, the U.S. Kuwait Business Council to provide a permanent platform uh, to develop and grow our bilateral economic relationship and further cement our strategic ties. Uh, we were in fact joined by, uh, I think several of the banks that are joining today in that launch event. And I know uh, Rick was with uh, his CEO, Ron O'Hanley from State Street, our, our co-chair uh, to participate in that launch event. Uh, we've been working toward this goal of the council over the past three years and have really benefited from the strong support of both the US and Kuwaiti governments uh, and during that time, we've established an annual U.S.-Kuwait Economic Forum uh, that's held on the sidelines of the government-to-government -government strategic dialogue. And I know uh, Mr. Bastaki has been kind enough to participate in that on multiple occasions. We've had a CEO forum with His Highness the Emir in Washington, D.C. We've convened an event with U.S. Secretary of State uh, Pompeo in Kuwait. We've brought a delegation of business leaders uh, to Kuwait, in addition to a number of high, other high-level meetings uh, in both countries, uh, all to build a momentum toward that official establishment of the Bilateral Business Council and ultimately to elevate and grow uh, our bilateral economic relationship. And as we look ahead to the rest of 2020, we know that we're going to have a robust calendar, uh, so please do stay tuned. Now, the Council, of course, uh, as the Chamber, is only as strong as our members, and I'm really uh, delighted that our co-chair, State Street, is playing a role uh, in today's program. Our Kuwaiti co-chair, of course, is Faisal Amutawa, and we thank him for his leadership. And we really want to thank our friends at the Kuwait Banking Association. Uh, not only are they a member or a partner in today's webinar, uh, but they're actually a founding member of the U.S. Kuwait Business Council, and we're, we're grateful for that. Uh, as are several of uh, the Kuwait banks, um, we have uh, ABK is a, is a member of the U.S. Kuwait Business Council, the Kuwait Finance House, and the Kuwait International Bank, all founding members of the council. So we thank you for your support. I do hope that provides some context for everyone and a little bit about both the U.S. Chamber and our Kuwait Council. I wanna add a special thanks uh, to, to Sheikha Aisa at KBA and Dr. Hamad for their leadership and their partnership and making today possible. And of course, uh, my colleague, Sarah Carley, 
who joined just a, a couple of weeks before we went into COVID mode. Um, so I spent most of my time getting to know Sarah virtually, but we're, we're delighted uh, that, that she's with us and, and really leading and taking on the responsibility of managing this new Kuwait Council. What we'd like to do now is, is turn to um, our partner for this event, the Vice Chairman of KBA. He's also Chairman of the Commercial Bank of Kuwait, uh, Sheikh Ahmad Al Sabah, for welcoming comments uh, on behalf of KBA. And then, uh, then we'll go to our friend, uh, Mr. Farouk Bastaki, to offer uh, a few comments, and then we'll go to our featured speakers. Sheikh Ahmad, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you for having me on the U.S. Kuwaiti uh, business panel. And I'd like to add that the business partnership between the U.S. and Kuwait is an integral part of both countries' strategic outlooks and will continue going forward. The partnership has been built on the foundations laid down by Dr. Arthur Bennett, the first American doctor in Kuwait who took up residence in Kuwait in 1909 and established the American Hospital in Kuwait in 1913 with the agreement of Sheikh Mubarak, the Emir of Kuwait at the time, whose daughter incidentally was one of the first patients. And this partnership built on the most noble of causes has next big step in the post-World War II age with a big push by the US to end colonization worldwide, which helped Kuwait uh, achieve its independence in 1961. Another step on this path is the collapse of the Bretton Woods uh, Agreement in 1971 and the pricing of barrel oil in US dollars without the convertibility to gold, which helped the US become the reserve currency of the world that we know today. Uh, this is an old, uh, we know this. And uh, a giant step in this partnership that will never be forgotten by Kuwaitis is the US-led liberation of Kuwait from Saddam Hussein's tyrannical invasion. And for that, I express our utmost thanks and eternal gratitude. Thank you, America. And I could keep listing steps, and there are many, but I'm afraid I will bore everyone listening in. Rest assured, there are many steps ahead, and we will continue climbing them together to new heights. Thank you. Well, Sheikh Ahmad, thank you for those inspiring comments and, and reflection on the bilateral relationship. And again, let me underscore our appreciation to the Kuwait Banking Association for the partnership in today's event and really everything that goes beyond that and the active participation in the U.S. Kuwait Business Council. We're grateful for that. Uh, with no further ado, we would love to uh, turn to our friend, uh, Mr. Farouk Bastaki, again from the KIA. And I know he's joined by several of his uh, all-star team members and we're, we're uh, Farouk we're just grateful and honored to have you with us today and please know we are grateful for all the support that you've provided as we've worked towards establishing the U.S. Kuwait Business Council and all that you do for the bilateral relationship. So Mr. Farouk we'll, uh, we'll turn to you and, and look forward to hearing some opening comments from yourself. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Steve. Uh, really appreciate it. It's, uh, it's an honor to be part of the, this event. And I would like to thank uh, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, the U.S. Kuwait uh, Business Council, and the Banking Association, the Kuwait Banking Association, to provide this opportunity. Uh, for me to, to give a few words about KIA and its relationship and its investment history, in the US. Some of you have heard the story before. I'm just going to bore you for two, three minutes about it. And, uh, uh, you know, so I'm going to give you a little bit of a background. Kuwait Investment Authority currently invests more than 50% of its portfolio, total portfolio, in the United States. And that's, uh, believe me, it's a huge amount of money. Uh, this started in 1953, which is uh, 67 years ago. It's a long time and it started by opening an account, I think in Citibank, and we still have that account. So it goes back a long time. KIA, just for, uh, for the participant who doesn't know what we do in the US or what we do exactly as Kuwait Investment Authority, we invest in equity, in fixed income and alternative investment. Equity, we are in large cap, small cap, medium companies, uh, different strategies, passive, uh, uh, active, or even direct holding, direct uh, uh, shares in certain companies. 
and the fixed income, we do also the, the, the whole thing, T-bills, T-bonds, uh, corporate bonds, TIPs, and so on. Alternative, we started in uh, early 80s, which is, you know, very long time for the alternative. I think it started in like 84 or something. And uh, we do private equity, we do uh, real estate, infrastructure, and hedge funds. These investments basically are done mostly through external fund managers, especially when we talk about uh, investment in the listed equity, it's done through external fund managers. People like the Black, BlackRock, Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, PIMCO, and others. The alternative also done with very well-known managers, mostly U.S. managers, such as uh, Blackstone, Carlyle, uh, KKR, TPG, and many, many others who are, we've been having this relationship with them for a very, very long time. Uh, also, also, we invest in, uh, uh, in large U.S. companies directly or through portfolios, such as, you know, Apple, Microsoft, Google, Amazon. Uh, we have a big chunk of Visa, BlackRock. So these are direct investments that we keep in for, for a while and it's done very, very well for us. Bank of America, of course, we, we, we are also a large investor there. Uh, Kuwait invested in real estate uh, through a hundred percent company called Foster Lane, which is uh, uh, it's uh, it's uh, based in Atlanta, Georgia. And what these people do, they invest in uh, core real estate, and core buildings, and core real estate, especially the office uh, and office uh, side in the United States. We have buildings in New York, in Washington D.C., and any many other cities. Uh, we participated in some development projects in the United States. We start, We were one of the earliest investors in Hudson Yard, which is the largest private uh, development project in the US history. When I say early, early meaning, you know, we were the first one actually with a related company. We, we are partnering with related and we did that and now I think it's, uh, it's one of the best projects in New York and it's very well, it has very, uh, you know, it's very well known. Uh, this is just a little bit of background about KIA and I started my, my, uh, my I introduced by saying the introduction by saying that we've been in the U.S. for 67 years. Uh, the last 20 years, for example, we increased the amount of money invested in the U.S. by 21 times. So whatever that number was 20 years ago, it's now 21 times X, uh, you know, which is, we hope to keep that track record, but it's, it's going to be a little bit difficult, but we will do our best. Finally, in conclusion, I would, uh, I would say that we had, Kuwait had, a very great and long standing relationship with the United States. And we appreciate the US support in all kinds of different uh, issues that, uh, you know, and all aspects that we've been, we have support of the United States. And of course, we will never forget the US role uh, in liberation of Kuwait in 1991. And thank you all very much for that. Thank you. Well, Mr. Farouk, thank you for that overview of KIA and in particular the, the relationship, the longstanding relationship that you've had with the United States. Uh, you're clearly a, an important driver in that bilateral economic relationship and being the, the world's largest or being the world's oldest sovereign wealth fund, uh, there's a lot to learn from you and we appreciate the top flight uh, operation that you run and the great team that you have. So thank you for sharing those uh, observations and reflections. We very much appreciate that. And we're, we're, again, we're delighted to have you with us today. Um, next you, up in our lineup, I'm going to uh, turn to a U.S. Chamber colleague, uh, our senior economist, who oversees uh, the analysis of the U.S. and global economics 
he actually joined the chamber uh, just in January um, of this year. So I don't know, uh, Curtis, if you knew what you were getting into uh, when you came to the chamber, um, but you've obviously uh, had to hit the ground running. Um, among uh, Curtis's duties are that he works to advance uh, the U.S. Chamber's indices and other economic uh, analytical products that tell uh, compelling stories about how our economy is responding to policy shifts, business trends, geopolitical factors, and obviously uh, unknowns, uh, occurrences like uh, COVID-19. For the last three years, uh, Curtis served as the senior economist at the American Bankers Association. Um, he previously was a research fellow on tax and economic policy at the Heritage Foundation, uh, covering implications of policy on uh, the United States economy. Um, he's testified many times uh, before Congress and is regularly cited in, in national news outlets. I also should share that early in his career, uh, Curtis worked in transfer pricing at PwC in Atlanta, and he's also served as a senior economist at the Tax Foundation. Uh, he holds an MA in economics from the University of Connecticut, a uh, BA in economics from the University of Richmond. Uh, Curtis, we really appreciate you taking time out, and we really look forward to hearing your forecast and thoughts um, on the U.S. economy. So with that, we'll uh, turn it to you. Thanks, Steve. Really happy, excited to be here. Uh, I'm going to walk through where uh, the economy is right now and where it may be going and hitting on all the, the various data points that we follow to try to get a, a hold on what is going on in the economy. I'm going to go ahead and, and share my, my screen so you can see the slides that I prepared. And hopefully you can see that now. We can. There we go. Okay, great. So one of the, 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 in the original, the initial fallout from COVID-19, uh, we saw a, a really big spike in unemployment here in the U.S. And one, one of the ways, the easiest, the most up-to-date way to follow that was unemployment claims. These are initial claims in unemployment. Prior to COVID-19, prior to March of this year, the record high claims for unemployment insurance in one month was back in October of 1982. And that was 695,000 Americans filed uh, back then. In the first couple of weeks of March, we we're talking 200,000. Uh, so we were uh, well below that. That's kind of average for the U.S., about 200, mid, mid 200,000 people filing for unemployment. Uh, that jumped up in the, in the third week of March to 3.3 million. The following week, March 28th, it jumped almost to 6.9 million. 6.9 million Americans filed for unemployment all in just one week. Uh, so 10 times the record, the, the previous record. It has, the good news is it's been, it's been follow, following ever since then. I think it's 16 weeks now that we've seen declining unemployment claims. Uh, however, unfortunately, you can see we're still above 1.3 million cl initial claims a week. So still a lot of people filing for unemployment. Now, the data is hard to collect. It's done by a state-by-state -state basis here in the U.S., and there's, there's some definitional issues and there's some backlogs. We don't know how accurate this number is, uh, but we do know that it's still highly elevated. Of course, we've had some reopening that's probably slowing now. Uh, so we want to also look at not only initial claims, but continuing claims. Continuing claims would account for those who have initially filed, minus those who aren't claiming anymore, presumably because they've gone back to work. And that has, becoming, has been coming down steadily since the middle of May. So that's really good news. Uh, we peaked at some, something around 22 million continuing claims. A four-week average is usually how it's looked at. Uh, and now it's down uh, to about 19 million. So still very, very elevated, very high, uh, but it does seem, seem to be declining. Now, with everything I say, keep in mind that this is, all these data points come from before the recent spike in cases here, COVID-19 cases here in the U.S., we are likely to see some pullback in, in all the economic data that we hit on today. Uh, and the, the general theme of what the, the data will show is that we had a severe contraction that was on par with the Great Depression and the Great Recession from 2007 to 2009. It's not hyperbolic to, to, to compare what has happened in the U.S. economy to uh, the Great Depression. Uh, but we've had some bounce back. We bottomed out in May, uh, or April and May, and we bounced back in June. Again, though, that was before the recent spike in cases. So uh, we're likely to see some tempering of that kind of data as we go forward. Uh, our jobs report has been very good in both, in both May and June. Uh, we've added back, uh, there was 4.8 million jobs in June, uh, two and a half million or so jobs in, in uh, May. So that's good. We've added about seven, seven and a half million jobs. 
uh, but we lost over 20 million from February, which was the peak. So there's still a long way to go. There's still uh, 17 something million jobs to fill. For, I'm sorry, 14.6 for, uh, million jobs to fill uh, to get back to where we were in February. That's going to take a long time. We are not going to get back to those levels uh, in, in the near term. Uh, the unemployment rate has come down. Uh, we peaked at about 15% and it's now just, just below 12. But there's still a lot, a lot of work and a lot of, uh, a lot of, a lot of, a long way to go to get back to the levels of employment we had prior to the crisis. Prior to the crisis, the economy was going was growing pretty well. Uh, we were growing about two percent uh, through 2019, and that was that was the case into the middle of March. Actually, this is how the economy was tracking about two percent growth. We had a little bit of headwinds from. Uh, both the, the COVID-19 crisis started as a supply side shock here in the U.S. We were having a hard time getting supplies from China, and that was contributing to a slowdown of, of growth in the first quarter. And so was the Boeing shutdown of production in the 737 MAX. So maybe we would have come in below 2% had we not had the enormous shock from COVID-19, but it did hit, and we, we had growth at minus 5% in the first quarter. And that's uh, sometimes it's, it's a little confusing how that's presented. That is what's known as an annualized number, uh, which means that the economy would have to contract by that much for four consecutive quarters. So we're, for, for you get a minus 5% growth over a year. What it really means is it's, it's, you can divide that by four. So the economy fell by 1.25% from the fourth quarter of 2019 to the first quarter of 2020. And that matters because of this next chart. Uh, these are what the various forecast as we follow our forecasting for the contraction of growth in the second quarter to be. We're talking anywhere from basically minus 30% to over minus, minus 43%. So when I say it's not hyperbolic to compare this to the Great Recession, this is what I mean. Uh, we're going to see a uh, record, record high contraction in the, or I guess it's, I guess you say record low contraction for, uh, for the second quarter. And these again are annualized numbers. Uh, so you divide those by four. So the average is something like 34%. So you divide that by four. So you're looking at a 9% contraction in growth from the first quarter to the second quarter. And that's on top of the 1.5%, 1.25% contraction in the first quarter. So over a 10% contraction uh, from, uh, from the end of 2019 to the end of the second quarter. Very, very steep. Uh, and uh, it will dig us a very, a very big hole, which I'll show you in a second. So the question is now, we're, we're likely past that, that steep contraction. Uh, you can see uh, how, how deep it goes on a quarter by quarter basis here. Uh, we should get a very strong rebound. Uh, it will, on average, those same forecasters looking at about 23% growth in the third quarter and then 9% growth in the fourth quarter. But the contraction is so steep in the first and second quarter, you still get an annualized number that is negative for 2020. Uh, but then you get continued growth in uh, into 2021 of four and a half percent, which is which, which is stronger than it would have been tracking and what you'd expect. This is all uh, the the idea that um, uh, the uh, sorry, I lost my train of thought. The uh, oh, the, the the letter shape of the recovery. That's what I was gonna get. At. Uh, a lot of talks about are we gonna have a V shaped recovery, a U shaped recovery? It's a little bit up in the air now. I would have said we were probably on on track for a pretty strong recovery, which would get somewhat V shaped, but you know, very sharp contraction. A very a very steep recovery, but the recent upticks in cases really throws throws that into uh, throws that into question. Mm -hmm. That said, we're going to have very strong growth numbers for the next couple quarters. I, I I would anticipate, which 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 is important to point out that there's going to be a a clear distinction between growth rates and levels, uh, which this next chart will show. So we're going to have really strong growth rates of all sorts of things, GDP, jobs, all other measures that I'll go through in a second. The thing is we're gonna be below the levels we were at before COVID-19 hit for a while. And that's what this, this chart shows. So even with those pretty robust growth numbers that I just walked through, it takes us to the middle of 2021 just to get back to the level of GDP we had before COVID-19 hit. Now, if I had done this chart a couple weeks ago, that was pushed out to the middle of 2022 because the growth numbers, the contraction numbers for the second quarter were steeper and the growth them and, uh, and that, that made it just made it long, a longer recovery period. Uh, they, they, those forecasters have cut back on that contraction number a bit and that has, has increased and in, or accelerate the recovery. This can move again. So if I did this in a couple of weeks and we get some data for the recent 
the recent shutdowns, this could get pushed out to uh, the end of 2021 or 2022. So a long way to go so we get full recovery because of the steepness. Look how steep that drop off is from uh, Q, Q, 2019 Q4 down to uh, Q2 2020, you're talking over a trillion dollars lost of economic value. Big hole to fill. It takes a long time to, 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 to fill it up. This is a, an index that we follow. The, it's called the Weekly Economic Index. It uses 10 real-time measures, things like unemployment, unemployment claims that we, like we talked about, staffing agency levels, real uh, same source sales, gas sales, steel production, en energy production. Uh, this is this is interesting because it shows just how steep the economy dropped off and how quickly it dropped off, and how it's slowly recovering. Uh, we're we're getting close. We're getting we're going in the right direction, although progress is slow. For scale, we are a lot steeper than we are a lot lower than we ever were during the the Great Recession and the financial crisis. So this has been a very very severe uh, recession. One of the things that will lead us out of the recession, of course, is consumer sentiment. Like how confident are consumers? The, more, the better they feel about the economy, the more they're likely to spend. They're doing better. They've, their sentiment and their, their confidence has, has improved. It bottomed out in April, and it has uh, approved, improved steadily in, uh, in, in May and June. Hopefully, we see. We'll get numbers for July in a couple weeks or in a couple days, and hopefully, we'll see continued improvement there. Uh, one thing that is important to look at for this is the future expectations, uh, because if you're strong, if you feel strongly about the future of the economy, you're much more likely to buy big ticket durable items like cars, appliances and homes and future expectations have been ticking up as well. Again, back to this rates versus levels issue. The rate of improvement is good, but we're still well, well below we were just back in February. So a ways to go for full for full recovery. And again, these these are from before the recent uptick in cases. Consumer confidence has, has jumped more than sentiment. They're roughly the same type of measures. It's just different, two different, uh, two different surveys that that look at this. Uh, this, but again, strong strong recovery in June. We'll see what happens in July. My my guess is that it will be an improvement, but the improvement will be a lot less uh, sharp than it was back in June. Interesting enough, we've had a big boost in personal income here in the U.S., and this comes because of the response from the government. Uh, the government has has boosted incomes by in two ways. Uh, one, they provided pretty generous payments to to individuals and families, twelve hundred dollars per person, uh, and then five hundred dollars per child. So a family of of four could get a pretty big check. They they phase out for income, but uh, that had helped boost incomes in the um, in the uh, in the short term. And then uh, unemployment insurance has been has been uh, plussed up. You get an extra $600 a week if you're on unemployment, above your, your traditional unemployment uh, payments. So that boosted incomes in April by 11%. Now, they fell again in May because those payments started to, to tail off. But they're still, you can see, look at May 20 there, it's still income still significantly higher than it was in February. Uh, so this is really boosting income. So, so there, there's a lot of money out there. The difficulty th the difficult thing here is these things that we're putting, the payments are about done to, to families done in the, un the unemployment insurance benefits. They stop at the end of this month, the extra $600. Uh, so this is going to come way down in August unless Congress does something in the interim. And so there's gonna be a big push at the end of the month here to do a, what's called a phase four bill to somehow keep the, the unemployment benefits, and maybe some other type of payments going. So we don't see a big drop off in incomes. Of course, it's harder to spend, uh, when uh, you're locked in, you're locked down, and and or you're not going out because of fear of the virus. So there, so so a lot of this money is people have it in in their their savings and their checking accounts. So they will spend it eventually. Uh, but that drop off in income could be is going to be a big sticking point here in the U.S. in in the coming weeks. I'm just gonna I'll flip through these things quickly now, so I can hand it over to Rick. Uh, prior to the prior to the COVID-19. Uh, wages were growing very strongly here in the U.S., and uh, they were actually outpacing inflation pretty pretty strongly. So real wages were growing. That was really good. The unfortunate thing of the fallout of from COVID-19 in, in the labor market and wages is that wages were growing the strongest for those at the bottom of the income scale with the, the fewest skills. It took us 10 years of churning through the labor market to get to that point where those incomes were growing fastest. 
that all that progress uh, has been undone because of COVID-19. The, those at the lower end of the income scale with the fewest skills have seen their jobs uh, go away at a higher rate, and it will take a long time to get them back to work, and it'll take a long time to gain them back to the income growth that they were experiencing just a couple couple months ago. Let's, uh, so uh, retail sales have been improving. Uh, that's good. We know that's going to that's going to be uh, as as the economy unlocks and people go back to s closer to normal uh, that that they'll be spending more. Interestingly, uh, in-store retail sales are still 82% of all sales here in the U.S. You wouldn't think that. You think most people still shop on online or move to shopping online. This has been a big growth, which I'll show you in, in the next chart. Uh, but still, uh, the vast majority of sales happen inside traditional brick and mortar stores and uh, that hasn't that has not changed uh, materially in, in, in the last couple of months although it did spike so you see a huge spike in April and May uh, th but there was a long-term trend the long-term trend was moving to online you get this enormous spike in April and May or actually March and April and then it comes back down in May so this would be really interesting for things like commercial real estate and just retail retail in general is what happens in the coming months? Does that does it, that percentage come back down and return to trend? Is there a, sh a permanent shift up, and how big how big is that shift? My guess is that we come back to come back towards trend a little a, a good deal, but that there's a somewhat of a permanent shift to, to shopping online uh, compared to in, in store sales. And again, that has a big impact on commercial real estate, the banking industry, uh, and there, there can be some long term implications there. Uh, real good on on the business uh, business side. Uh, business confidence is rebounding in the U.S., uh, slightly more than in the U.S. That's good news. Again, this is prior to the uptick in cases, uh, the caveat that all the time. Uh, so businesses are getting more confident. Uh, the, let's see if I can find the, yes, this is, here we go. Uh, this is small businesses here in the U.S. This is the National Federation of Independent Businesses, their monthly survey of small businesses. Really strong growth in June. This came out yesterday. So this is really good news that, that small businesses are feeling better. Uh, most of the most of the components of this index uh, increased sharply for the month, uh, so that that was that was good news as well. And I'll wrap up. Uh, manufacturing is doing well, as are non-manufacturing services. Uh, so business side is looking looking better, and housing is do, has has rebounded pretty strongly in uh, in May. We're starting to get June numbers now. Uh, this is one area that could really help push the push the economy out of recession and help uh, strengthen the strength in the recovery and for two big reasons one is the COVID-19 hit during the spring buying season a lot of Americans buy housing in the spring season that was delayed they couldn't couldn't buy houses at the same level although the people were still buying houses but not at the level they would have and then we're going to have low interest rates for the foreseeable future on mortgages so uh, we are anticipating a pretty strong housing market in the coming months but I just want to get quickly to uh, issues with uh, with our Federal Reserve, and I'll, I'll close on this. The uh, the Federal Reserve has been very active in its response to COVID-19. Uh, its balance sheet has more than doubled. This this chart is a little out of date. The balance sheet is now over seven trillion dollars. And one of the governors, uh, Lyle Brennan, yesterday said that they're going to have to continue this response. So look for continued growth in the Fed's balance sheet. Uh, we have no idea what that's going to be. It, I don't think they know. They're just going to they're going to keep on doing what they're doing. Providing liquidity through their through the various facilities they set up. For the most part, though, the growth of the, the Fed's balance sheet isn't necessarily those those facilities that they set up for direct lending to businesses, to municipalities, uh, into other, the repo facilities. That's the that's the kind of the orangish color. The real the run up is the traditional Fed buying of mortgage backed securities and U.S. Treasuries. That's where the the the, the majority of growth is coming from. Uh, so the currency swaps, which is kind of the purplish grayish color, uh, that has uh, that is certainly a part of it as well, but it's small compared to the, the Fed directly buying those mortgage backed securities and treasuries and adding them to their, their balance sheets. Of course, where's all the liquidity going? It's going into reserves on banks' balance sheets. So this will cause, this may cause a problem in the future. I'm not sure the Fed cares right now, or I, I probably, I share their view that inflation is a problem for tomorrow, uh, and tomorrow could be five, 10 years from now, uh, the big problem right now is making sure that you keep functioning credit markets, uh, keep financial markets liquid, and we don't have deflation, uh, which is what uh, we had. We had inflation measures falling uh, for the last few months, but that has steadied somewhat. 
Uh, so the, the Fed is fighting the, the problem in front of it right now and not worrying too much about in the future. And I think that's probably the right approach. With that, I'm going to stop. I could go on all day with all the different things going on. It's a very interesting time, but I don't want to cut into Rick's time. Happy to answer any questions you have uh, when we get there. Uh, thank you, and I'll hand it over to Rick. Thank you so much, Curtis, for uh, such an insightful presentation. And we really appreciate you being here with us today. Switching gears slightly to focus more on the banking sector, um, I have the pleasure of introducing our next guest. Um, as Steve mentioned earlier, Rick also joined us at the launch of the U.S. Kuwait Business Council uh, last year. So thank you so much. It's wonderful to have you back. And um, we're really excited that you could join us today. Um, Rick is joining us from our council co-chair, uh, State Street, where he is the executive vice president and chief global, or global chief investment officer for State Street Global Advisors. He's responsible for all investment management activities, including research and trading. He is also a member of the firm's executive management group. Prior to his role, uh, Rick was the head of Global Active Equities and previously the European Chief Investment Officer. He held a variety of po positions in quantitative fund management and research, including as the head of quantitative research and head of structured equities at Gartmore Investment Management. He has a bachelor's in science from Lancaster University and a master's of science from London Guildhall University. He's a regular writer and broadcaster on investment issues um, and speaks frequently at industry events. So very perfectly poised to speak to us today. Um, welcome again, and we look forward to hearing your perspectives. Thank you very much. And uh, thank that was a great setup as well from Curtis. So thanks for that. Uh, so let me see if I can get my uh, working the uh, is that visible? Um, not yet. If you look at the bottom, there's a share screen button. It should be green right in the middle. Uh, that's the one I hit. Yeah, I've got shared screen, but I, yeah, that's the one. I found it. Thank you for the help. Perfect. Um, so I'm going to talk about global trends in banking. Um, it's actually been really interesting putting this presentation together. Those who know me know that I have a great interest in financial market history, but we're actually supposed to be looking forwards, not backwards. Uh, but if you'll indulge me, I'll look a little bit backwards at first and then look at what's happening post COVID-19 uh, and maybe more importantly, what's happening to the business model of banks globally, which is changing really uh, significantly. And it's changed. that's probably been accelerated by the events of the last several months. If you look at the timeline of bank history, we go back appropriately to the, the Babylonian idea of banks and everything in between. I think no one can claim to have invented banking, but we all know that it has, a, in a sense, a very simple model. Uh, certainly fractional banking has a pretty simple model, um, but it has spawned many different subcomponents over the years. Um, but if you look back in the more recent past of what's happened before the global financial crisis, we've had this very long term trend of reducing uh, interest rates. This goes back about eight centuries, but People talk about lower for longer. That's been going on quite a long time. Obviously, if you go back to the 18th century, you had sovereign defaults because the sovereign needed money for a war. He'd raise money from rich people. You know, wouldn't always pay it back or maybe there was a, there was a problem. Um, but what you found is that that sovereign default risk has gradually declined over time, certainly in, in terms of um, repaying in your own currency. Uh, and that's changed the nature of banking. At the moment, we are in a kind of lower for longer environment looking forward. And how's that changed things? It's reduced quite substantially the amount of leverage in the system after the global financial crisis. And it's, at a consequence, reduced the return on equity of banks. So I think if you look back to what, you know, many nostalgically view as the golden era where returns on equity would be in the, in the teens, that was only really achieved through quite high levels of leverage. And after the global financial crisis, leverage came down quite a lot. So not surprisingly, even though return on assets uh, remain reasonably high, which is the line 
that, that you can see there. The return on equity, which is what happens after you've adjusted for leverage, uh, came down. It's actually been a, a little bit more buoyant in the last several quarters before the crisis, um, but it's certainly below. So this is a, a chart that's saying banks in the US have become somewhat less risky because they've been forced to delever quite substantially. So that's thrown an emphasis onto the business model, the operating costs, and a whole lot of other things that have been, uh, I think, a big challenge for those running banks. But if I just turn to the more recent past and the COVID-19 uh, crisis, Kurt, Curtis did a great job of sort of explaining what had happened. And for me, these two charts uh, characterize the difference between the global financial crisis, which is the bottom chart, and the top chart, which is the COVID-19 uh, crisis. So the boxes that you can see there, each of them represent one of the actions that was taken by central banks or other authorities during the first financial crisis. And it took a really long time for things to get straightened out. And there was a lot of concern about moral hazard. All of those concerns appeared to go out of the window completely in this particular crisis. And the dates have gone a little bit funny, apologies for that. But you'll be aware that during this crisis, in a matter of days and weeks, you had very substantial action taken by central banks. And we were actually at the heart of that. In fact, it was very gratifying that we were invited by a number of the central banks and sole policymakers to comment on what was needed to get the financial system working again. And there was no question of resistance. They, they were welcoming that input and actually implementing the input very rapidly. And as Curtis pointed out, an enormous ramp up uh, in central bank reserves as a consequence of that. And we don't begrudge that. We think it's been incredibly helpful. But if you look forward and you think, right, well, what are the drivers from now on? I, I said at the beginning, a bank's a pretty simple business in a way. You've got, you've got the volume, which is how much your uh, balance sheet expands or contracts. And then you've got the spread between what you're lending at and what you're taking in uh, and paying for deposits. And ultimately, your top line is determined by those. That's your, in a sense, your revenue. Your bottom line is determined by non-performing loans, provisions, and importantly, operating costs. Now, we know that banks are more complicated than this simplified model, but it's pretty important to understand that when you think what's going on during the crisis. Asset growth is happening because companies are uh, taking out standby loans or they're actually borrowing a lot more. Consumers are borrowing less. Trading revenue, as we saw from results yesterday, has been very strong for, for a number of the largest banks, both in Q1 and Q2. And net interest margin is the, is the problem area because the impact of quantitative easing, both the flattening of the yield curve and the absolute fall in yields uh, has been a pretty big problem, not just for the short term, but for the long term, as we've seen in Europe in particular. And the cost base at the moment is going sideways. Now, I think there is an enormous amount of optimism about cost base in financial institutions going down and productivity going up. And I'm going to talk about that in the second um, part of the presentation. But what we also know is that provisions have started to appear. And just in the last several days, we saw some cautious statements from banks about uh, the, the way in which they're thinking about provisioning. So where has that left banks with investors? In the short term, I think if you look at this survey from the Bank of America, and we look at our own data at State Street, our custody data, really telling us the same thing. Banks are not super popular at the moment. People look at banks and they're a little bit cautious both about the, the, the spread, the net interest margin. They're cautious about the provisions that need to be made in the future. They're actually a little bit cautious about disruption as well. The good thing is that banks are now perceived a little bit more as part of the solution to the, uh, to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic and the fact that they're, together with the governments, assisting in economies staying alive but that's not been terribly popular with investors in some respects, and they, they've become more underweight in banks relative to the rest of the, uh, the universe of investments. So what's happening with provisions is that they're going up pretty rapidly. And as we know, US has always been ahead of the curve in the sense that US philosophically tends to recognize losses much more quickly than the rest of the world. Obviously, there's regulatory um, issues that have affected that as well. Um, but the fact that the U.S. is also a large consumer economy has quite a large impact on the provisions and non-performing loans as well, because there's an expectation that that unemployment will bring with it 
a bit more stress to the consumer, even though at the moment household balance sheets are in quite good shape. In the future quarters, that may not be the case quite so, so much. There has been enormous help from governments and there's a lot of programs around the world where the government takes a first loss position. So as, uh, as corporations are being propped up in a sense by a combination of governments and the banks, not all of the losses will fall on the banks. And so there is a, it's a little bit uh, confusing to pick apart what the eventual losses might be for the banks. And I think there's also this emerging dividing line between the US, Europe and other parts of the world where I think the US has certainly got a more immediate way of recognizing problems than Europe. And if I were to put it, you know, not very politely, the Europe and some other countries follow the pretend and extend sort of model of the world where they try and keep the show on the road a little bit further uh, along. What does that leave us with things like capital ratios though? Capital ratios have been recovering incredibly strongly um, and in fact, uh, as part of the research, I was looking at banks in Kuwait and their reserves have been incredibly strong um, in the lead up to the crisis. But if you look at Europe or US, there's been a very, very strong recovery in capital ratios. The question has been, can buybacks continue? And I think there's been, I think, appropriately a, a, a pause on buybacks in many cases. Um, I think dividends can and should continue in banks by and large. Investors need them. And I think they have a relatively small impact on, uh, on capital ratios. Europe is a lot more hawkish than the US. I think the European Central Bank, the Bank of England, other central banks have been a little bit more cautious about dividends um, than they have been in the US. But if you look at the longer term trends in global banking, um, this, the, the real imperative um, is to reduce operating costs. There's not much you can do in a sense about net interest margin. You can take more risk if you like. You can look for uh, more opportunities to get deposits in at a, low, at a low price. But it's really the operating costs that matter. And I think particularly because quantitative easing uh, reduces uh, potential income, there's been enormous pressure on it. So what does that mean? Often branch reductions. And uh, the chart here shows the US, the number of branches that banks are in the US. I found it a little bit surprising that even after the global financial crisis, they're actually increasing the number of branches rather than decreasing. But you'll see in common with the rest of the world, that's now rolling over pretty substantially. And in some countries, they've halved the number of branches uh, in the last decade. It leads us on to the sort of question of how is that going to happen? You can't just shut branches, but clearly the events of COVID-19 I've encouraged many more customers to can conduct their business, not just transactional, but wealth management business by uh, virtual means. And what's called the Scandi model, the Scandinavian model, uh, is one in which banks have often got a cost to income ratio of 30 to 40 percent. That's enormously different to the rest of the world, where it's still often stubbornly stuck in the 60s. It's not easy to go from A to B. Um, clearly, um, mergers and acquisitions are part of the equation here. And I think in um, areas of the world where you've got enormous numbers of competitors, there is the potential uh, to reduce the number of banks and thereby accelerate this process of uh, branch closures and digitization. But digital, as I'll come onto, is a double-edged sword because it enables these disruptive businesses to come into uh, what it has been, in some countries, a, a more cozy um, business. So challenger banks can come from a number of places. You can challenge yourself. Um, you can have a pure play um, that's a new business like a Monzo or Revolut uh, or many of those other startup businesses. Or you can have digital affiliates like Ant Financial in China and many of the others that have kind of affiliations with some of those technology companies. They offer lower operating costs. They don't start with a legacy uh, platform. They're typically more customer friendly, particularly on things like KYC. And I think what the analysts that I've studied look, look at is that there is a threat to revenue, whether it's remittance revenue, transaction revenue, processing revenue, and the core business of, of saving uh, and lending. But the cost savings are much bigger. So in a sense, disruption is a bad news story, but it really is disguised in, as a good news story. As a global investor in banks, this is actually light at the end of the tunnel to improve the business model. The other point worth noting is that the disruption, in a sense, is a bank issue, but it's also an issue of 
dealing with the unbanked. There are estimated to be 1.7 billion people unbanked. And we know there's been a lot of progress, particularly in Africa, in mobile banking within PESA, but also Amp Financial, which is very active in many countries around the world. Um, I've seen estimates that seven to 800 million customers will be now banked by the end of 2022. And the reason for that is there's a lot of enabling technology. Uh, there's enabling technology like ID. So if, if you can identify through biometrics, the population, it's much easier to go digital and to have things like mobile banking. But there is a tension here. And whenever you have this sort of disruption discussion, I think regulators get a little nervous and it's right to get nervous. It's a highly regulated activity. It's at the heart of financial stability and consumer protection. And so you need to balance pretty carefully the speed at which you're going to have that disruption. The other disruption, which is important to note, which is uh, a neutral, but it could be a negative, uh, is digital currency. I think Libra, my personal view is that Libra was a fantastic innovation, maybe carried out by the wrong party because Facebook had this kind of haze over it that was unfavorable. Um, and I think there was a lack of trust as a consequence. But the basic idea of Libra, it's a little bit like an ETF in some respects, but it's a, it's a fully backed tethered currency, multi-currency that would really potentially reduce transaction costs very substantially. Um, clearly, if it became a currency of its own that was fractional, there's control issues and financial stability issues. But I think what it gave rise to was a, a lot of new thinking about digital central bank currencies. And I think, again, these would be very welcome provided they didn't cause a run on deposits in banks. Because if consumers can have digital currency, why would they want currency in the bank, particularly when interest rates are virtually zero? Um, I think deglobalization is worth more than a passing mention because a lot of the deglobalization is to do with tariffs, but behind the scenes, there's a risk of financial deglobalization. And again, it's a threat to the profit pools of global financial institutions that's pretty substantial and also the weaponizing of financial institutions through the use of sanctions. I think it's not just about China, US, but certainly that's in the headlines because of the, uh, the risk that we run when we're investing everywhere, as our, our, our friends in Kuwait are, we're investing everywhere for clients in different parts of the world, we're investing in global banks, and yet we face these risks of uh, a need potentially to div disinvest or certainly to have governance over banks that ensure uh, that they're all in good order. So it's created a lot more uncertainty and I think investors all would want a reward for that uncertainty. So I've gotten an incredibly cook, quick Cook's tour going back uh, 3,000 years but I think there are some very obvious near-term challenges to bank economics. Um, you could say that banks are unloved I think if you were to ask me what's my favorite, it would be European banks still, where the, uh, where the tangible assets to equity ratio is very favorable. You've got very, very cheap banks, and I think they're priced uh, for a much bigger disaster than the one that's actually unfolding. But uh, they also have to deal with this digital acceleration. I think the COVID-19 will accelerate many trends and their positive trends on over, overall, and they'll actually increase productivity in the economy. One of the points Curtis may have been thinking also is that out of this crisis, are we going to have an improvement in productivity or are we going to have zombie companies? I'm optimistic enough to think we'll have a, an improvement in productivity and part of it will be things like an acceleration in digital in finance in which costs will fall faster than revenues. It'll be beneficial to the economy and it'll be beneficial also to ultimately to shareholders in banks. So I apologize if I sometimes do speak quite rapidly and I'm racing through this somewhat, but I, I'm also aware that we've got very distinguished guests and audience. You may have questions for Curtis and I coming from many directions. So I'll pause there and let's see if we can open for questions. Well, thank you so much, Rick, for uh, that wonderful presentation, very enlightening. Um, and we, we very much appreciate your time. It's, um, as, as you mentioned, that we've come to the point of the presentation where um, we welcome questions from the audience. Um, I did see one come in just a little bit ago following Curtis's presentation. Um, 
And it's asking, how do you explain presented recovery signals while COVID-19 cases are returning to higher levels again? Sure, I can, I can start with that. Uh, and I'm interested to hear what Rick says as well. I think two things going on. One is markets are forward looking and they see that the economy is starting to unlock. And as it does so, there's a lot of uh, pent up buying demand and that there's a lot of people who are going back to work. Now that's going to be tempered somewhat uh, as, as cases pick up. But I think that that plays into it. Uh, and I think also that I think that the markets are savvy enough to look at the uptick in cases and then the up the uptick in hospitalizations and deaths. The until up until now, deaths and hospitalizations are not rising at the same rate as cases. Uh, so that's good. Uh, whether that's we're younger people, or less older people are are being infected or we're getting better at treated at it. Uh, that's probably all part of it. And then the, the last part is that uh, advances are being made on therapeutics and on a potential vaccine. And again, markets are forward looking and they see three, four months in ahead. And while things look rough now, if you get those therapeutics and you get that vaccine, uh, we could be back on a, a very rapid recovery pace in the not too distant future. I, I think we're in the chronic phase where we live with the virus in different ways in different parts of the world. I think it looks obvious now that the US has a much higher risk tolerance, or at least the government of the US have a high, has a higher risk tolerance than elsewhere. And I think they may tolerate a higher level of infection uh, lasting, and they will do partial shutdowns as we see in other countries like Germany and elsewhere. Um, and I think investors, it sounds very ghoulish in some ways, they, they appear willing to accept. I think equities are too expensive, by the way. They're a little bit overvalued. Um, but I think investors are assuming this chronic phase just carries on, but it's not bad enough to shut the economy down. I agree with that. Um, thank you both for, for your um, answers to that question. If, does anyone else um, in the audience have any questions? Please go ahead and use the raise your hand option um, to, to speak directly. Um, in the meantime, we also have another question in the chat, um, the chat group. It says, do you think that COVID will begin a trend of banks leaving high rise offices in large cities and decentralize their workforces. And then um, also that there are a lot of implications, if that is the case, to uh, commercial real estate. Well, yeah, banks, I can, I, go ahead, Rick. Banks, banks have a lot of legacy real estate. Um, they won't be in a rush to dispose of it uh, very quickly, but I, I do think they'll rethink the footprint. Um, in, in the long, so setting back, in the long term, People like cities. They've liked cities for thousands of years. I don't think that's going to change. I think that we're in the chronic phase. We'll get through it eventually. I'm not saying we'll return totally to normal, but I think there is a desire to be close. And I think about our business. We're operating really well, but are we training young people well when they're all operating from home? I don't think so. We, we need to have more proximity. So I'm not sure the change will be quite as dramatic as one might think it could be. Curtis, sorry, I cut you off. And we've got other questions coming as well. No, I, I'll just add, I, I agree with that. And I, I do, but on the margin, there's going to be some, there's going to be some change, right? There, there is businesses that have found out that they can work as efficiently remotely as they were uh, operating in, in person. And if they can cut their office space expense some, they're going to go ahead and do that. So there's going to be some trickle down in the commercial real estate market. Uh, we just we just don't know to what extent that will be. We already we already know that certain, some businesses have said go remote through the end of the year. Some businesses, I, I believe Twitter, uh, the U.S. company Twitter has said that you don't ever have to go back to the office. They're they're fully remote. So there's uh, I, as I, I I agree that we're going to mostly go back to the office, but there's going to be some impact on the margin. Let's see. So we also have um, another one speaking more towards. Um, the security aspects and given the vulnerability of digital banks and the cyber risks of disruptions, um, do you think that banking in the future will be a mix, um, and we touched on this briefly, but a mix of the brick and mortar and um, the other side being the full online digital banks? 
I think it'll be a, a, a mix of brick and mortar for a while because of custom and practice, but I think it's going to change. Um, and it, it'll, it'll change quicker than people think. So that's the sort of part, the second part of the question. I don't think people will retain brick and mortar because of cyber risk. I think it'll be for other reasons. But I think the cyber risk point's a very good one that, I mean, in fact, whether, whether banking is digital or not, cyber risk is an enormous risk that we should all be incredibly vigilant on. And I think regulators are aware of it. We're aware of it as owners of banks, because when we talk to boards of banks, we need to make sure boards have sufficient skill that they understand how to deal with cyber and how to make sure that the management of banks deal well with cyber. Um, I don't think it will be a reason to hold back from digital, though. To, sorry, to, to hold on to bricks and mortar. And do you think that, um, I'm sorry, Curtis, were, were you going to jump in? I didn't mean to cut you off. No, that, that's right. It is a long-term trend towards going online, uh, and that's that's likely to accelerate. I'll, I will point out that my mom is 75 years old, and she's still trying to go get their, her passbook stamped at the bank, and they finally said no. <laughs> they, would, they wouldn't stamp it anymore. So then, um, do you think that the regulators will relax some of the guidelines pertaining to capital adequacy and LDR ratios? There has been a little bit of forbearance um, during the crisis. You know, some of the emergency programs required central banks to, you know, to enable banks to produce more liquidity for customers uh, in money market funds, for example, in the US. And those actions didn't have an implication for the capital ratios of banks. So I think there's a recognition, not that the post GFC legislation went too far, but that at a point where capital ratios have been very high during an emergency, you have to make sure you're not being pro-cyclical. And I think there was a mature uh, viewpoint taken across many central banks around the world that they didn't want to add to the problem by being uh, too pro-cyclical. I don't think that's the same as unraveling the guidelines, but I do think they're gonna come into question because in, certainly in some parts of the world, there was a layering of guidelines on top of one another that probably meant that there was, there was an unnecessary um, amount of capital. Um, and I think that's had a detrimental effect on attracting new capital. It's also had a detrimental effect on liquidity in trading markets in some cases. Yeah, the, the real, real quick, the, the Fed suspended a lot of the, the capital requirements in uh, March or April. Uh, so those went, went, out the, went out the window and then they, they've done the stress testing, uh, which has been interesting. Uh, there's gonna be some big hits to the, the banks in the, in the, coming, the coming months, uh, but they think that they will withstand the capital They'll have enough capital to withstand the losses and continue to lend. So that that was the good news in the stress test. Uh, but it was interesting that they very quickly suspended those capital requirements in the early part of the crisis. So then as we look at um, kind of how the pandemic has affected um, the global economy, um, what is the view on an even larger U.S. and global debt? Uh, level and how do you see this unwinding or playing out in the future? I, I can go ahead and take that. So that when you say debt, I assume this is talking about uh, government debt, centralized debt. Is this from the? This is from the. Okay, this is from the chat. Uh, so I I could talk about this for an hour, two hours. I used to do this as part of my job when I was at the Heritage Foundation was to talk about. Uh, big deficits and, and the accumulation of national debt and uh, go around the country, go on television, go do all this stuff. And I got to say, no one cared. No one cared at all. Uh, there was a short blip in 2010 when people cared and then the, some policymakers started to care and then it went right back and no one, no one cares. So we had this long-term accumulation of, of debt, but let me try to show you, share one quick slide uh, that, Really, it, it gets it gets to the heart of what's going on, which is that, yes, that uh, we have COVID-19 has certainly added to the debt, 
uh, but we were on an unsustainable trajectory beforehand. The orange line is what was going on before, uh, and we were going to hit 100% of GDP in 2031. That's where the orange line. Uh, this the chart isn't isn't quite right. Excuse me. Go, go ahead. Sorry, three year old. Uh, the the black line isn't quite lined up, but the, um, it's supposed to hit. It was going to hit the 100% of GDP, which is a rough rule of thumb for problems uh, in 2031. COVID-19 relief really bumps that up, but then it, it gets there in 2028. So it, it, it accelerated the process for about three years. Uh, but we were on an unsustainable trajectory as it was, and that's driven by entitlement spending, spending here in the U.S. Hopefully the silver lining is that this makes our, our federal government, our Congress, much more uh, act, likely to, to act in the, in the near term rather than waiting for that crisis to hit. Uh, but I'm not all that confident that that, that will happen. Thank you, Curtis, for that. That was really helpful. Um, there's also a question in here regarding the stock markets um, just globally. As we see the numbers uh, continue to rise, I think both of you spoke to this a little bit about the resiliency of um, not, not just US citizens, but global citizens as well. So the question is, with the rising cases, um, why are the stock markets rising? Kind of what is, is the expectation? Yeah, well, I, I think in the long term, the cases do matter, but they're not material enough to affect um, the labor supply. To, I mean, to, to, to put it maybe more clearly, if GDP is a function of productivity growth and the size of the labor force, if you have a pandemic like the Black Death or the, or the Spanish flu, it wipes out a lot of young people, has an enormous impact on GDP. If you have a pandemic like this one that disrupts the world because of the economic shutdown, but actually kills primarily less active people, people who are not in the workforce, then the impact's obviously less. So I think what markets are looking for is, are the, are the infections getting to the point where the economy needs to shut down or not in a substantial way? If, if that is the case, then you've got to be much more concerned about the rebound of both GDP and earnings into 2021 if you think that the infections will still rise, but they'll be kept somewhat under control, this kind of chronic model that I pointed out earlier, and you have episodic shutdowns, you know, Californian restaurants for a while, other places, then it may not be bad enough to cause that earnings outlook to be too badly disturbed. But if it gets completely out of control, I mean, that's the, the, the nightmare scenario. It gets completely out of control. You have to have a shutdown, a total shutdown again. Uh, market's not pricing that at all. I think the market is a little bit too optimistic. And I think it's pricing now the 2022 earnings, not 21, but 22 earnings. And the path to 22 is quite rocky. I mean, we, we maybe we all agree that in 2022, earnings will be similar to 2019, maybe even slightly higher. But between now and then, you'll have many, many shocks, many bankruptcies and other issues to deal with. And a lot of recapitalization because there'll be companies that are bearing enormous debts uh, that need to go back to their shareholders, either in private equity or in public equity. And that will be, again, another headwind that equity markets will need to deal with. So, you know, as we, as we look at the banking sector from a global perspective. Um, can you speak at all to how the GCC and MANA region um, kind of interacts, um, the banking sector interacts and how it will progress moving forward out of this pandemic, um, you know, both in the region itself and then from a global perspective as well? Well, I have to be humble on this on this talk, I'm, I'm standing in front of, or sitting in front of gentlemen and representatives of KBA, KIA, who are much better informed about the banking industry in GCC and MENA. But what I have heard when I've been involved in discussions in the region is that there is a desire at the top, should we say, to accelerate digitization, and to some extent to encourage M&A. You've seen this in Saudi Arabia, more, maybe quite recently, um, so I think there is a sort of top-down view that the banking sector needs to advance very rapidly, but I think it's, it's hard. And I think when you've had traditional 
industry of any type, you see this everywhere around the world, and they've got quite a nice business model that works well, it's sometimes hard to have a significant and disruptive change um, that you bring about yourself. So I, I think there will be the same changes you see elsewhere because the issue of being able to reduce operating costs substantially and, and give better customer outcomes is the same everywhere, but it may be a little, a little bit slower. I don't know whether anyone would volunteer from the KBA or my friends from KIA to comment on that one, but I, I say I'm humble in the, in the company of those who know a little better. Uh, I could add a little tiny bit on that. Uh, yes, definitely uh, the COVID uh, pandemic has shown that the regulators have, have, have managed to get on their toes rather than the, on their heels in, in, in pushing through digitization, pushing through the uh, uh, lessening the paperwork needed for a lot of products and stuff. And, and they're becoming much more swift in, in evaluating new things. And that's coming online now with the, uh, a lot of wallets are coming on now streaming Kuwait, uh, uh, opening bank accounts online without having to have that physical presence and stuff. So uh, yes, we do see this coming because of the COVID-19 uh, uh, epidemic and uh, costs are coming down. Some, uh, uh, some painful and some uh, well deserved. So painful in that with branch closures and, and, and shrinking, you do have uh, uh, less employment and that's, that's not good to the economy as such, but on the flip side, you do have efficiency gains. So it's a two way street, but that's my two cents without elongating the answer. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for your comments there. It's, it's very much appreciated. I think that um, we've reached the point where if you have any final thoughts or closing words, uh, both Brick and, and Curtis, we would love to hear them. Um, and following that, I will turn it back over to Steve to, to close us out. I think I said everything I wanted to say. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, me too. I, I think I think we do face a future that is is has got temporary interruption, but I think some of the things that are being accelerated, I'm very excited about. Certainly in technology and improving productivity, there are many things that normally take a long, long time to get changed, and we're changing them really rapidly, and it's getting people ready for further change, which can really improve the outcome for both you know, people themselves, citizens and countries through healthcare systems getting better, uh, but also as investors through efficiency, productivity and earnings in the out years and in, in, a, in a few years time, looking much, much better. Well, Rick, thank you so much. And, and to our friends at State Street, we uh, value not only your presentation today, uh, you and Curtis, I think provided incredible substance, a lot of food for thought and incredible insights. So really appreciate uh, both of your presentations and your comments and your, your remarks throughout the Q&A as well. Uh, very, very insightful. We really do value that. And I do want to give a, a special note of appreciation again uh, to Mr. Farouk Mastaki and the team at KIA for your support um, of the bilateral relationship and being with us today. We appreciate you doing that. And I do want to turn uh, to uh, Sheikh Ahmad and give him the last word, our partner in today's webinar, uh, at the Kuwait Banking Association, uh, where he serves as vice chairman uh, of that prestigious organization. And we really do value uh, KBA, not only as a partner, again, of the U.S. Kuwait Business Council, uh, but as uh, a friend and an ally in, in all things in the bilateral economic relationship. Uh, so, Sheikh Ahmad, I'll turn it to you for uh, the final word. All I can add is thank you very much, as you said earlier, to the insightful uh, charts and, and presentations. And I definitely enjoyed the uh, forward looking thoughts and the uh, a lot of history I definitely enjoyed, which is uh, looks to the past. And, the, and I'll definitely be reading much more into that going forward. So thank you, thank you again very much. Thank you for uh, Steve for setting this up and uh, looking forward to more insightful talks. Thank you again.
thank you everybody and wish you well. Um, we really do appreciate it and we'll stay in touch with all of you. If anybody has any questions, uh, feel free to reach out to Sarah or myself or of course uh, your friends at the KBA. And, and, and Mr. Farouk, I, I see you're unmuted. I do wanna give, why don't we give you uh, the opportunity to share any, any final, final words? No, well, just wanted to thank you all. And it was very useful for me to, to hear the opinions. This is and Rick, and it was uh, very useful for me. Thank you very much, just wanted to thank you. Thank you, an honor to have you with us today. Well, thank you everybody, wish you well, be well, stay healthy. And uh, thank you so much for joining us today. And thanks again to uh, Rick and Curtis for the uh, wonderful presentations. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, -bye. Bye everybody.